Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. Nice to have uh, the great John Meacham. How about another hand? I'm such a big fan oh, of John. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. It's so great to talk to you, and you're, you're as exactly as warm and funny and all those things as a I thought you were. This is one of those conversations, you guys, that could go on for hours. But we will be respectful. Let's at least get one, so you're okay. <laughs> we will be respectful and, um, and go within the time frame. Uh, congratulations on the Thank book. Thank you. It's really fantastic. Thank if you guys haven't read it yet, you won't regret it. Um, it's, it's so good. I was telling John, it's one of those books where it's so easy to read in that it kind of invites you in as a reader, and yet it's elevated at the same time. It's like, oh man, I, it's like you just you love reading this, and you just brought into the world in such an interesting way. Thanks. And uh, so, that's a, that's it for us. Thank you all for coming. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> it's all downhill from here. Well, these because these books can't. You know, you can be very intimidated when you see like a big book about yeah. Lincoln. There have been many books written about Lincoln. I was misinformed. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. I'm trying to elevate the guy. Get trying to elevate. Him. So what was your reason, knowing that, you know, you would think everything possibly that could have been written about Lincoln right. must have been written. Right. Why you, John Meacham, said, nope? Well, our friend David McCullough, who uh, we just lost, uh, once said that if there's a book you want to read and you can't find it, you should write it. And the book I wanted to read right now was an implied argument about what the hell we can do ourselves right now, right? And the last time democracy was in this serious a state, the last time the Constitution was under this kind of stress was not 1968, it was not 1932, it was 1859, 60, 61. And so I wanted to be basically in conversation with Lincoln. That sounds weird. It sounds like the Shining meets C-SPAN. Uh, so I, I, it's, it's okay to talk to dead people. It's when they talk back mm -hmm. that, you get, that you get in trouble. Um, and I've been trying, like all of us, I think, trying to answer the question of what is essential to making this experiment continue? And I do believe it should continue. And I know there are some on the left who don't think so, and there are a lot on the right who are doing everything they can to keep it from continuing. <laughs> um, but I believe it sh in, the, in the absence of an alternative, mm -hmm. and this is where Lincoln was in many ways, uh, if it's going to continue, what does it require? And to me, <clears throat> there's light and wisdom in Lincoln's example of having at least one, doesn't have to be six, but at least one moral commitment above your own perpetuation of power. And Abraham Lincoln, who was not perfect, and we'll talk about that, Abraham Lincoln fundamentally believed that slavery had to be put on a path to ultimate extinction. And anti-slavery politics drove him. That was his moral commitment. And it was not a political winner, right? He lost two Senate races over it. Mm -hmm. He only won 39% of the vote in 1860. He never had really a, 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 an active majority that was with him because the North was full of white racist Democrats during the war. Draft riots in New York 
where insurrectionists, treasonous, uh, white northerners killed innocent black people in New York because they didn't want to go fight the South. So this was a much more complicated story mm -hmm. than sort of the march of time, Lowell Thomas, you mm -hmm. know, Lincoln comes out of the log cabin, he frees the slaves, we build the monument, we're done, right? Little more complicated. Um, and so I wanted to figure out why. Mm -hmm. uh, I know how he did it, right? but I wanted to know why. Well, one of the things that I appreciate is you really take your time, uh, you know, really explaining the lineage of slavery and even Lincoln's own lineage, yeah. you know, at the same time, putting both of them in a context for the modern reader, right? And I have to take a little bit of exception when you said um, white, uh, racist white Democrats, because the world at that time, it's fair to say, all white people were white supremacists. It wasn't, yeah, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't just held by Democrats, you know? Like no, the, uh, the world of white supremacy held that blacks or Negroes were inferior, mm -hmm. right? That was, that was a hurdle that time has had to, the eight, to jump over as opposed to it being in a political party. And, and the Supreme right. Court in 1857 right. ruled right. that they were inferior. That was the Dred Scott decision. Right. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I was thinking about copperheads in, in a partisan way. Absolutely. Right. Uh, un unquestionably. And one of the great failings of Lincoln, um, and there's a moment. There's a moment when you write biography where you always want to reach back and grab your guy and <laughs> right. shake him. I'm like, why can't you get this right, you stupid right. son of a bitch? Stop spilling uh, logs. What's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. You know. Come on. Uh, you know. FDR and the Holocaust. Uh, Jefferson mm. and slavery. Mm -hmm. And Lincoln with this. He articulated better than anybody else in American history that black people were included in the Jeffersonian assertion of human equality in the Declaration of Independence. That was a radical position, mm -hmm. okay? But he stopped there. He didn't follow the logic of his own brilliantly articulated argument to say, therefore, the franchise, citizenship, social and political equality must follow. Let's be very, very clear. Abraham Lincoln was not Martin Luther King in a stovepipe hat. He wasn't. He was on a spectrum of white opinion that put him, and I don't like using right and left here, but mm -hmm. for our conversational purposes, that put him to the right of most abolitionists, who were also, many of them, terribly racist. Well, most abolitionists, if we're going to be fair, were anti-slavery, but not, necessar not necessarily believed in the equality of all people. So, yeah, so here's... <laughs> if we're making if, distinctions... If, if, you, if you all have yeah. taken pains to be here, right. let's be honest, A, <laughs> a you watch too much cable news, right? right? And you probably have a couple of Ken Burns tote bags, so... Mm -hmm. And it was radical for abolitionists to hold that opinion, so we're, not, we're being... It was very... Well, Radical to have those opinions about... Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, William Lloyd Garrison said, whenever has slavery been abolished and followed by social political equality? It has never happened right. in the world. This is William Lloyd Garrison. Um, so, yes, every... One of the things that's important to remember is everyone who was anti-slavery in the United States in the 19th century was not an abolitionist. And not every abolitionist, as Larry just said, was an egalitarian. And so these categories are important not to excuse the past for their shortcomings, but to explain them mm -hmm. and to understand the world in which Lincoln had to govern. And you don't have to take my word for it. Take Frederick Douglass's. Frederick Douglass had a keen understanding mm -hmm. of the political realities that uh, Lincoln had to confront. And, you know, my view of biography and history, the, the moral utility of it is not for us to look back adoringly uh, or condescendingly, but to try to look the past in the eye mm -hmm. so that when we look it in the eye, then, forgive the metaphor, then when we look in the mirror, maybe we can see ourselves more clearly yeah. and figure out what is it that we're screwing up now that people in the future, if there is a future, will look back and note <laughs> there's the future. Yeah, yeah. That I, was funny. Y'all can. I, it was quick, <laughs> yes, so y'all can yes. laugh now. Um, I think it's good though that people know how normal it was to have those opinions. I think 
to me is important, as opposed to, this is why I wanted to make that distinction, that it's some, some extremist that would hold that opinion. It was, it was normal to have those opinions. It, it, yeah. was, it was abnormal to have the opposite opinion. Right, right. And so that's why it was, you know, it was, it's unusual for somebody who had political ambitions, as it seemed Lincoln had at a very young age, you know, it seemed like he wasn't idealistic so much when he was young, but he, he w wanted to be a politician. Is that is that right? Yeah, uh, it's, it feels that way to me. Like, yeah, so. uh, Lincoln's very much a um, a figure of the age of Jackson. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Jackson, whom I wrote about years ago, uh, was the first white Amer was the first American president who came from the lowest rungs of white society. And he showed that there was a path of social and political mobility for ambitious young white men. The first six presidents of the United States were either Virginia landowners or mm -hmm. Adamses from Massachusetts, <laughs> right. right? And so Jackson, who didn't know his father, who uh, you know totally self-taught, mm -hmm. shows the way uh, in many ways. Let me kind of tell a quick story that is about take your time. It's Doesn't about, have to be quick. Yeah. It's about three of my favorite <laughs> topics. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but. It's the only thing you'll remember. Um, so this is a story about three things. I know it's going to sound like the setup for a Wilmore joke, and there's one parachute. It will be anyway, John. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Um, this is a story about George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, Andrew Jackson, and Donald Trump. Again, and there's one parachute. So they go into a bar. They go into a bar, right. <laughs> and the rabbi said, no. Is it, this is actually a true story. So in 2017, March of 2017, uh, Trump announces that he's coming down to Nashville, where I live, to do a tour of the Hermitage where Jackson lived and sort of embrace the Jacksonian legacy. And so I was sitting at home, and I thought I should do something. So I wrote an open letter to the president mm -hmm. uh, saying, Dear Mr. President, welcome to Nashville. But if you're going to embrace Andrew Jackson, don't just embrace the crazy parts. And there are plenty of crazy parts of Andrew Jackson to embrace, right? He once said that his only two regrets in public life were that he had not shot Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House, and hung John C. Calhoun, his own vice president. I mean, he wasn't wrong about that. Yeah. And <laughs> the past is prologue. But, uh, and so in a kind of a big moment, the, um, uh, the local newspaper ran a, kind of a gutsy decision. Mm -hmm. My letter was the only thing on the front page of the newspaper that greeted President Trump. It had no effect, whatever, of course, on, on Trump. The next day, true story, I'm walking into lunch, and the phone rings, and it's George H.W. Bush, whom I'd written a book about. It took me 17 years. It was supposed to be posthumous, but the son of a bitch wouldn't die. Um, I'd bring it up. He'd say, not going to do it. Um, and so uh, Dana Carvey once said the key to doing the old man's voice was Mr. Rogers trying to be John Wayne. <laughs> it's a perfect description. So it was, it was, it was President Bush. That's and great. he'd spent a lot of that winter in the hospital down in Houston. And so his staff was printing out stuff for him to read. And they printed out this letter. And he read it. And he called. He said, I read your letter to Jackson. And I thought, oh, shit, the old boy's losing it, right? He thinks I'm writing letters to dead people. Mm -hmm. And so I said, thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, actually, that was a letter to Trump about Jackson. And without missing a beat, Bush said, yeah, but Jackson will pay more attention. <laughs> and then he hung up. Nice. He thought of the joke. He wanted to deliver it. That's fast. He hung up. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. Yeah. That's end of story? That's it. Oh, OK. Uh, good diversion, then. <laughs> thank you. No, it's, it's, it's just my favorite. It's, it, it tells you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> The, la the last moderate Republican in California. <laughs> uh, Lincoln is, he is interesting. He's, there is a mythology about Lincoln, and I think over the years it's, it's been kind of broken up a bit. And, you know, even reading your book, there's, you realize how much dismantling, you know, is still happening, yeah. <laughs> you know, as you're reading it. But, and it's not all just, I don't want to sound like it's on the negative side. It is interesting, um, the story of him viewing, I think it was some captured slaves or something like that as a boy. It's yeah. Fascinating. Was that, do you think that was I, the, the first instance of him thinking of this as an injustice? Lincoln was very precise in his language. Mm -hmm. uh, our greatest presidential writer, better than Jefferson. Um, and when he said something, he meant it. And so he said, wrote in 1864, I am naturally anti-slavery. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. Naturally means from birth, by nature. 
So that was my, that was the breadcrumb I started to follow. Mm -hmm. So why was that? Again, not a big political winner. Um, William Seward, Secretary of State, uh, New York Senator, who was kind of the founding eminence of the Republican Party, a much more important national figure than Lincoln. He was to Lincoln's right on this stuff. And so what, why was Lincoln naturally anti-slavery? I have a couple answers, but prospects. One is his parents were part of white emancipation, anti-slavery Baptist churches in Kentucky. Hmm. Now I tell you, how many white anti-slavery Baptists could there have been in the Commonwealth of Kentucky in 1809? 100? 200? That's, it ain't three. Um, so, and Lincoln would memorize sermons mm. and repeat them to his playmates. It's why he was a lonely child. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I used to do it too, which explains a lot about me. Um, so the ethos was anti-slavery. Now, it wasn't just moral. It wasn't just William Wil Wilberforce kind of stuff. These weren't proto-Quakers. Uh, they were poor white farmers. Poor white farmers were against slavery because they couldn't afford them. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not glamorizing here. They, they were hating on slave owners. They were hating the slave owners because <laughs> an aristocracy of race diminished their economic possibilities. Right. Well, but uh, there a was lot a of that white resentment uh, was a lot of the spark of a lot of the racial animosity in the Northeast for years, especially in places like Boston and New York. Boston. Between the Irish and blacks and that kind of thing, that same kind of feeling. Just Bi thought I'd throw that in. Bill, there. look, Bill Clinton <laughs> has, uh, it's, it's, it's a somewhat familiar point where I come from, but Clinton has ever put it really, really well, that one of the things that happened from Reconstruction forward in Southern politics was rich folks started getting white folks who were poorer and black folks to point at each other mm -hmm. so they wouldn't point at the rich white folks, right? And so that, that capacity to create a wedge issue, and that was very much in mm -hmm. the air uh, for Lincoln. Yeah, many times blacks were union busters, uh, started the, in fact, the red summer of 1919, many blacks were brought up from the south to, I think, Missouri to bust the unions. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, what do you expect is gonna happen? Right, right. You know, and that, uh, and as you say, he mm -hmm. saw uh, enslaved people in chain gangs on mm -hmm. the Cumberland Road. He right. saw slave markets in New Orleans when he went down there. Um, and so, but Illinois, where, so he's born in Kentucky, lives in Indiana, moves to Illinois. Illinois is not a model of racial egalitarianism, to mm -hmm. say the least. Um, and so it is, as, Larry was saying, it's very much non-egalitarian but anti-slavery. And that's hard for us to kind of keep those things separate in our heads, but that was their reality. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a remarkable thing that Lincoln was able to do ultimately what he did, not least because, well, A, he didn't set out to do it. So... Lincoln's vision of the end of slavery was gradual, um, uh, compensated emancipation. Mm -hmm. Gradual is going to take a lot of time. And the compensation was not to the enslaved, but to slave owners. Right. And the only great modern model of emancipation was Great Britain. In 1833, they abolished slavery in the empire. There were 800,000 enslaved people in the British Empire. There were 4 million in the United States. Um, they excluded India, where it was a significant problem. And the amount of money that the British government paid to slave owners was 40% of the annual budget of 1833. They borrowed so much money that that instrument that funded the compensation for slave owners was not paid off until 2015. That's you know, crazy. I'm it, so glad you said that. I was hoping you would say that yeah, line. It's incredible. I was floored. I it's was floored. It's incredible. It. Yeah. It's incre British prime ministers of recent memory, were their families got these payments. Yeah. 
So it's, again, it's not to celebrate, therefore, hey, we killed 750,000 people and we ended slavery without paying anybody. They, I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but context is important. Mm -hmm. And the other thing to remember about the uh, complexity of all this is the, one of the great paragraphs in presidential literature. It's the one that Sam Watterson reads when Aaron Copeland is playing in the background. Mm -hmm. um, Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. This Congress and this administration, we, even we here, will be remembered in spite of ourselves, down to the, in honor or dishonor, down to the latest generation, whether we shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of man on earth. Goosebump stuff, all right? Every president has wanted to sound like that. Mm -hmm. It comes at the end of a State of the Union message that was entirely about gradual compensated emancipation that would have kept slavery in the United States, are you ready, until 1900. Hmm. And it's one of those moments when you do what I do for a living, there are these kind of dork realization moments. I had a physiological reaction when I read that. It's sitting in the middle of the American canon. It's, it's in a State of the Union message, but I'd not, if I'd read it, which I probably had not, mm -hmm. when, I saw, when you see a president in cold type say, we will have slavery until 1900 AD, it is incredibly sobering. And I sat back like this in my chair when I read mm -hmm. it. And again, I'm not trying to celebrate, therefore, Boy, didn't we do great. But again, context matters. Yeah, everything comes at a cost. Um, how close was Lincoln to quitting politics? I mean, we, it feels like we almost came close to, <laughs> to not having a President Lincoln. I mean, who mm -hmm. runs for president after you know, him feeling like he didn't have a career, losing to Douglas in, that was two years before he actually ran for president. Was yeah. it in 58 or 56? 58, Douglas? 58. 58. So what makes Lincoln decide that he's not going to give up after losing that? Part of, it was, the 1858 Senate race was very much seen as a dry run for that presidential race. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Republicans, remember, had only been founded in 1854. So they'd only had one presidential election, mm -hmm. uh, John Fremont. And Lincoln, interestingly, had been in the running for vice president in that period. He was a Whig who'd come over, partly because and he, a lot of Whigs became know-nothings, which were the anti-immigrant folks, um, wall builders, if you will. Um, Lincoln was very much pro-immigration, so he couldn't do that. Um, Illinois was a big state, mm -hmm. so it was important. Uh, part of his national standing was based on his capacity to communicate. His articulation of the anti-slavery, pro-union cause with this layer of, and this is incredibly resonant, I think, for us today, this layer that if democracy fails here, it's not gonna work anywhere else either. This is the great experiment. Mm -hmm. And if popular government's not gonna work, there'd already been, the 1848 revolutions had already kind of collapsed. French democracy had collapsed, of course, 50 years before. America was kind of the last thing standing. Mm -hmm. And he saw all three of these issues, slavery, union, global democracy, with free markets, fewer uh, territorial grabs. He saw these things as intertwined. And so the narrowness of his loss uh, was part of what encouraged him to do it. Um, and he was the one person who, little like, this is how Harry Truman ended up being president. In 1944, FDR had a far left Vice President Henry Wallace, and wanted Jimmy Burns from South Carolina, who was a segregationist. And so the far left, the, the right didn't want Wallace, the left didn't want Burns. Harry Truman just kind of checked a bunch of boxes. Mm -hmm. Lincoln kind of checked a bunch of boxes. He had fewer enemies than the other contenders. Yeah, I feel like 
what hasn't really been said, like Lincoln wasn't a firebrand, like, we have to end slavery. Mm. It's bad. <laughs> it's not that thing. It was more like he almost, I'm going to use the, the word tricked people, but yeah. he, he politicked people is a better way to put it. Like you write about how he would deflect a conversation about abolition or that into a joke and deflect that, having full intention, <laughs> yeah. know, a yeah. full intention to do exactly what that person may be fearing or whatever. Yeah. But he was very good at that. And, it, and uh, what's interesting is um, um, I love how uh, you described, because um, uh, I want to talk about Frederick Douglass and Lincoln too, where Douglass kind of describes Lincoln entering the White House the same way an, yeah. An ex-slave enters New York. A fugitive you know, slave. Yes. Slipping out of the South exactly. to the North. Yeah. Is that a fair description? Yeah. You think? Did Lincoln kind of cloak his true intentions in some ways? Sure. At, and declare them all at the same time? Well, so... Talk out of both sides of his mouth? So, <laughs> y y yes, but, which is what you get with me. Uh, <laughs> it's like, and yet, are the two words of American history. Yeah, we're terrible, and yet... We're not as terrible as the rest, you know. Um, and improv classes. As, well, that, yeah, sure, that's works true. Works in improv classes. I'm sure that's true. Um, <laughs> as Churchill once said, democracy is the best form of government except for all the, you know, the worst except for all the others. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, he, he was a deft political operator. Mm -hmm. That has tended, however, I think, to turn him into a reluctant emancipator mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the scholarly popular literature. This idea that he wasn't really committed to this, he was pushed into it by circumstance, he did it to win the war. Mm -hmm. That he does seem all over the place in those first three years he, of his... No, I'm, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that's fair. I think that he was consistently anti-slavery. Mm -hmm. There's this, the narrative about Lincoln is that he grew in office. The translation of grew in office is that he came to agree with me. That's when people say yeah. that you grow in office. That, that's <laughs> it's what when they, you evolve. Yeah, you something. evolve to my... I evolved on that. Yes, yes, you know, oh yes, Ging Gingrich evolved, you know, okay, <laughs> yes. yeah, not really. Um, well, they don't believe in evolution, so... No, I know, it's... Yeah. it's so. <laughs> Only the left can evolve on something. <laughs> it's the old, it's the old <laughs> joke that the, the... Not the old joke, but an updated one, Henry Adams. To me, the movement from you know Lincoln to the 45th president disproves Darwin, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> there's that. Um, it's true. It's a very very good right, point. right. Yeah, it's it's very good. That point. poster in class ain't exactly you know. <laughs> you have to turn it around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like just take a selfie in front of it and it'll be reversed. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he grew. I think he, it's less that he grew in office and mm -hmm. more that he rose to the occasion. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important distinction. Um, or he was a tactician, maybe? Like, what's going to... Well, sure, but he's, yeah. he's got to govern. Mm -hmm. um, he's got to you know, win the war. He, he did not... Uh, you know, he decides on the Emancipation Proclamation in July of 1862. Mm -hmm. Seward says, if you do it now from a position of military weakness, it will look like a last-ditch effort. Mm -hmm. So wait for a victory. Lincoln, who admit, did not often admit this, but actually admitted, I had not thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. And he took that piece of advice and waited for Antietam. And great victory basically stops uh, the genuine threat to the North, even before Gettysburg, and then issues the preliminary proclamation. And then holds to it throughout 63 and 64 unto giving up the White House. The 1864 presidential election is one of the most fascinating ever, mm -hmm. not least because of the simple fact that it took place. Think about that. Hell, we're fighting about this stuff just because somebody's lying about it. But they're in a civil war. The commander-in-chief of a nation in an existential armed struggle mm -hmm. does what? Holds a full, free, and fair election and pledges that if, as he expects, he loses, he will cooperate with the incoming president, who would have been George McClellan, who was for ending the war and rolling back the Emancipation Proclamation, mm -hmm. thereby preserving slavery. Mm -hmm. right? Remember, history is not just about what happened, it's what could have happened, what worse could have happened. 
And, um, and the 13th Amendment was on the ballot. It was, on, it was in the platform mm -hmm. of, of, the, of the Republican Party in 1864. The chairman of the Republican National Committee who was the editor of the New York Times, this tells you how long ago that was, <laughs> comes to Washington in August, says you are going to lose if you don't say that emancipation does not have to be a precondition for peace. That was Lincoln's claim. I will talk to anybody, but emancipation has, cannot be on the table. That has happened. So Lincoln, at the risk of losing the White House, and the war, because he respected the Constitution that he was defending, said no, I can't. men act on incentive. And black men under arms have pinned the US on their shoulders, he borrowed this image from Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. have eagles and the US and they've been given guns and they have fought and died for this and I am not going to re-enslave people who have done that. It was a principled stand mm -hmm. in the midst of that. So was that tactical? Sure, it had a tactical impact. Mm -hmm. We needed black men to win the war. But he could have said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna deal with all that. Mm -hmm. Everything's negotiable. You know, there are any, way, any number of ways to rhetorically get around it. He said no. And after witnessing the example of the sacrifices the black soldiers made and everything, that may have stiffened his resolve at the same time, you know, if he's using that as an example. Like having, like the war also could have stiffened his resolve, whereas before, I mean, remember, you know, he didn't know what to do with, with black people or that yeah. sort of thing. Maybe we should send him to Costa Rica or, yeah. oh, well, or, that, yeah. or, or, or on an island somewhere or whatever. Yeah. No, he, 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 look, the colonization is hugely important here because the, the respectable plan of emancipation in the middle of the 19th century was this, that, as I said before, there would, there would be gradual emancipation. It would take place, it's like uh, Simpson Bowles or entitlement reform, right? We're gonna mm -hmm. do it for 50 years so mm -hmm. that you, you who are voting on it now won't be affected. So it would be 40 years, biblical 40 years. Mm -hmm. There will be compensation for the slave owners. Delaware voted down a, a gradual compensation uh, plan by one vote which was in 1861, if it had passed, I think things would have been very different because mm -hmm. it would have meant that somebody was trying um, to do it that way. Uh, so gradual, compensated, and then voluntary removal. And he funded uh, a plan in Haiti where black people were sent. There were black abolitionists who believed in this, mm -hmm. uh, not many, but some. Frederick Douglass was against it, and that was vital. Um, but Link, we can't let Lincoln off the hook. As late as 1863, this was still a possibility. Again, because he wasn't thinking of a modern, multi-ethnic, integrated democracy. And my view, for what it's worth, is that most people weren't. And I have a theory that, you know, we debate whether this country was founded in 1619 or 1776. Mm -hmm. This country that's getting ready to go to the polls next week was founded in 1965. The first integrated electorate in American history was in 1968. The Immigration and Nationality Act signed in 1965, doesn't get much attention mm -hmm. in the other great society legislation, was what undid the national, nationality quotas of the 1920s, which had been what FDR hid behind when he didn't want to take Jews into the country mm -hmm. in the 30s. So by lifting those quotas, it created the modern wave of immigration. That's where we are. That's what, where we come from. And so, Was Lincoln a brilliant politician? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. My argument is that what sets him apart, we've had a lot of brilliant politicians. What sets him apart is that he was a brilliant politician who believed in a principle that was larger than his own political future. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's interesting, um, the team of rivals, as it were. I, I'm, yeah. gu I'm guessing people are referring to 1864 and 1860, right? Was, when was, was Andrew Johnson vice president 1860 and 1864? No, it's one, of the, it's one of the great counterfactuals. Um, mm -hmm. So here, you all, you all have not had this thrown at you in a long time. Hannibal <laughs> Hamlin was the vice president of the United States from 61 to 65. Okay. Uh, a Maine Republican. A President Hannibal Hamlin would have done very different things. Right. Johnson was brought on the ticket because they were trying to carry Kentucky and Missouri. Yeah, because it is curious, Tennessee. you know, as much as Lincoln was putting his foot down on emancipation and, and slave, you know, slavery and all that, that he chooses someone like Johnson it, who, can, uh, who is clearly and not makes any bones about it, and, his opposition to all of the things that he did. It's like if Obama had Trump as his vice president for the last four years. It's not that <laughs> far. Yeah. It's not that far apart. A um, couple of, it, it was a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. um, two caveats that are just worth bearing in mind. One is with the exception, A, like every other politician I've ever met, Lincoln didn't actually think he was ever gonna die. Mm -hmm. But the, one of the thing, one of the great self-esteem things, and which is interesting because all these guys are so insecure and crazy, it's remarkable how they all seem to think that they are the exception to eternal life on Earth. Uh, mm -hmm. Franklin Roosevelt was like this, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely like this. Um, <laughs> there was a great political scientist once who said that Franklin Roosevelt's philosophy of the presidency was himself in it. Uh, and so I think that there was, a, there was a little bit of that. That's the reason why they're president. They're yeah, oh no. Big, outsized you Out know, of, egos and personalities. There's a reason why they think they should be leading the free world. Right? Out of 300, you know, even you know, George W. will tell you, you know, it takes some huts, but, uh, you know, 330 million people, you say, hey, it's me, baby. Um, you know, so yeah, it absolutely does. Right. Um, one thing is, presidents didn't, choose running mates in the way we think of it now mm -hmm. in the 19th century. It really was the convention. Um, oh, okay. that's and true. so that's a little that's different. True, right? But if he had really, right. if he had thrown himself in front of it, he could have stopped it. Yeah. Um, but he didn't. And that's, yeah, one of the great tragedies is, is the Johnson yeah. presidency. Do you you think, mentioned Team of Rivals. I just want to yes, say, sure. um, so my friend Doris Goodwin, who wrote that wonderful book, mm -hmm. um, quick detail about a very small category called Great Tweets. It's like French military victories. It's very tiny. Um, but about six months ago, so so, somebody sent out a tw tweeted that if Mr. Rogers and Doris Goodwin had had a one night stand, I would have resulted. And I thought it was great, right? That's pretty good. Doris was kind of pissed off. <laughs> so she called. She, she, said, she said, couldn't Mr. Rogers and I have had a loving marriage? And you were, th I said, no, 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 sweetie. He picked you up in the C-SPAN bar. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, it's better when it's a little seedy. Yeah, I, that's yeah. my yeah, argument. Doris is not sharing yeah. that view. I'll tell yeah. her you said that. <laughs> she probably agrees. Exactly. <laughs> she had to put on that public front. I know, you know? exactly, exactly. She, That's that news hour. Yeah, know. she's she, great. I had a, a chance to talk with her. She's awesome. Uh, do you think the Civil War was, was unavoidable? I do. When, but, you know how you mentioned you know, yep. England did it differently. Was it really unav unavoidable here? It was unavoidable. Well, I, I think so, because mm -hmm. um, if you engage, and this is scary given where we are now, but if you really read what they said, if you mm -hmm. engage with the secessionist literature, oh, yeah, I've if, read it, yeah. if you read the Southern mm -hmm. sermons where they were grabbing the Bible and trying to make it into a pro-slavery document, mm -hmm. it, was, it wasn't a different understanding of politics. It was a different understanding of reality and human nature. Mm -hmm. And that scares me a lot right now because white Southerners from my part of the world were giving up on the American project at, at, with, which had politics as a mediation of differences. Mm -hmm. And they wanted it to be total war so that they would have perpetual power. And I think it had to come. And I know that Lincoln thought that, 
and one of the most profoundly theological things ever uttered by an American president was said on Saturday, March 4th, 1865, when Lincoln stood up to give his second inaugural to one of the first integrated crowds in the history of the national capital. Mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass was there. A lot of the soldiers we were talking about were there. And he says, into the, the line we all remember, right, the needlepoint pillow line is with malice toward none, with charity for all. Mm -hmm. Great, great peroration. Again, it's the middle that matters. In that speech, the President of the United States, not a conventional Christian, not a conventional religious believer, he went to a Presbyterian church. I'm an Episcopalian. I think Presbyterians are kind of boring <laughs> because if it's all foreordained, what's the point? It takes all the fun out of it. They're like Quakers who sing. But they, it's maybe the one part of California where I can make Protestant jokes. So come on, <laughs> help me out here. Jesus. Um, he stands there and he says, he asked the question you're, you're asking, he's asking himself, was this inevitable? You know, and the war came. But why? And he said, both sides pray to the same God, both sides read the same Bible, both sides pray for victory over the other, and yet the war continues. So God wasn't answering the prayers of either. So why was that? And Abraham Lincoln said, it may be that every ounce of blood drawn by the lash must be answered by an ounce of blood drawn by the sword. Mm. And if that be the case, then let it be said today as it was 3,000 years ago, quoting a psalm, that the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Whoa. Sit with that for a second. Yeah. The President of the United States is saying that there is a God, there is a divine force beyond temporal events who is so interested in the geographical area of a particular place and the, that polity, that he is measuring the ounces of blood before he will end the Civil War because slavery was that profound a national sin. That was Lincoln's view. And on that same afternoon, you know, he, can see, he sees Douglas from the steps of the Capitol. Douglas comes down to the White House for the public reception. And in a sign of America, in all its greatness and horribleness at the same time, the guards at the White House gate hadn't really gotten the word that Lincoln wanted the gathering to be integrated. So they tried hmm. to rush Douglas out the back door. They tried to eject him. Someone intervened. Douglas goes into the room. Lincoln is a great speech maker. Douglas is one of the greatest speech makers ever. Mm -hmm. He asked him, you know, Mr. Douglas, what did you think of my speech? <laughs> and Douglas said, Mr. Lincoln, that was a sacred effort. Mm. It reveals, I think, that at least the people who had been most engaged in the hour to hour month-to-month, year-to-year conduct of the war came to believe that the war itself was a divine punishment mm -hmm. for slavery. It seems to me sometimes you can't appreciate someone's true mettle unless a tragedy happens or that sort of thing. You know, like yeah. Link, the true measure of Lincoln's greatness came in the wake of his assassination, I believe. It, it's almost like you don't want to say that it almost had to happen for that to be appreciated. But in the light of history, yeah. even Frederick Douglass, his view of Lincoln after he was assassinated, feels a little different than maybe when he was dealing with Lincoln at the time. You know, yeah. or, or it's, you know, it has a, a different yeah. feel to it. What, what do you think of that? I, so I, um, it is said that a statesman is a politician who is dead. And it often takes, and this is what I do for mm -hmm. a living, it often takes a long time mm -hmm. to see. You have to get farther away from the mountain to judge its true height. Mm -hmm. And this happens again and again. 
Harry Truman left Washington in 1953 with a 19% approval rate. Mm -hmm. Fewer than one in five Americans thought Harry Truman was a good president. 20 years later, after NATO has worked, the Marshall Plan has worked, and Richard Nixon is in office, and that matters too. George W. Bush will tell you that Trump makes him look like Cicero. <laughs> you know, <laughs> shit, I don't look so bad. <laughs> um, so it matters what comes after. Um, it changes the perspective. Mm -hmm. It happened to my friend, George H.W. Bush, who only 36%, I think, of the country wanted him reelected in 1992. And he dies a statesman of the Republic mm -hmm. because the passions of the moment cooled a bit. Mm -hmm. And I say this to politicians in, in the arena now. It, it's pretty cold comfort. It's like, well, when you're dead, we're going to love you. Uh, you know, they don't really welcome that. Uh, and Truman once said about, F, about both FDR and Lincoln, heroes know when to die. Mm. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, I think Lincoln, Michael Beschloss, my friend, and I talk about this a lot, which shows you how exciting we are. Um, it's like, hey, Monday Night Football. No, 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 let's talk about the counterfactual of Lincoln and Reconstruction. Woo! Dude, you read my mind. I know, I know, I know. Let's go to the, let's go down to, you know. Um, let's go to the Hall of Records and hang out. <laughs> the National Archives pub. Um, it might, we might have a different view of Lincoln mm -hmm. if he had had to deal with Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Because he wasn't, you know, Charles Sumner, the senator who was beaten nearly to death, and was basically right about almost everything in the fullness of time. Sumner had, for Reconstruction, what he called, and this is very popular now as we recon, re, reconsider Reconstruction, mm -hmm. uh, the state suicide theory. And th that theory was that by seceding from the Union, the Southern states had committed political suicide. And so those states were now unorganized federal, they were conquered land and should be reconstructed entirely along federally mandated lines. That was sort of the, over here. Lincoln was here. Uh, Lincoln wanted us, he never put it this way, but the more I've thought about it, Lincoln was asking the North to do something that's really, really hard, which is basically be the father in the parable of the prodigal son. Right, take them back, be happy it's over, and forgive them. And there's a very interesting debate unfolding in the country now, which is by not insisting on some repentance, did that feed the quick move, enable the quick move to Jim Crow, Plessy versus Ferguson, and that century of, of shadow. W.E.B. Du Bois was very good on this. Frederick Douglass was good on this. Um, John Hope Franklin is good on this. I think it would have. I think. I think it would have been better, but it would not have been perfect. Yeah, when you say that century of shadow, it's a great term. Uh, a lot of that, to me, was fueled by racial resentment coming out of, of course, emancipation and Reconstruction, especially, re arguably, Reconstruction, maybe even more than emancipation. Um, and it seems like that's kind of evolved into cultural resentment. You know, the racial resentment, now there's cultural resentment, it seems yeah. like, you know, where uh, it's not parties at war, but it's right and left, it seems, at war, you know. Where are we right now, you know, in the light of this book and thinking of Lincoln's time and comparing it to now? Are there true comparisons or is it just a country at odds, but it's not the same type of uh, de destiny, I guess, for that yeah, division? Yeah, I don't think we're going to have a civil war. Um, I do think at this hour, we're living through a period of sustained civil chaos punctuated by violence. We saw it in San Francisco last weekend. We'll see it at early voting drop-offs in Arizona. We'll see it in Georgia, I'm sure. Um, 
We saw the most vivid example of it on January 6th. What sets this moment, well, let me tell you how it's similar and then how it's different. Sure. <laughs> it's similar in that in the 1850s, a huge chunk of the country believed its own interests were more important than maintaining a system where their interests could contend to prevail. Does that make sense? They wanted to prevail right then. And they weren't willing to entertain the possibility that they wouldn't get their way right away. That's why the Civil War came. The white South decided this. And it's very clear in the literature that they just decided they were breaking away. And I, again, I live in Tennessee, so when I say I have conservative friends, that's redundant. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think it's, I think parts of the country, parts, elements in the country are there. Um, the number I always use is 34% of the country is always kind of crazy. I, that number comes from, that was the number of folks. It's very precise. It's Trump's base. Actually. It is. No, that's exactly, <laughs> no, is. that is exactly what it is. I know, I know. And 34% <laughs> is the number of folks who told Gallup in 1955, after he had been censured, that Joe McCarthy was right. Hmm. Okay, so I've always used that number, 34%. Um, What's, what's terrible about this particular point is that it's really 48% hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a delta That's there. That's a big difference. Yeah, a 14 or 15%. I think part of it is it's economic anxiety, anxiety. It's also it's racial animosity, which is entwined with that. It's fears about globalization and its implications. It's the intoxicating drama of always believing you're under attack and always believing that you're right. We're being driven right now by a, a machinery of perpetual political conflict. And it doesn't matter what the quality of the fuel is that goes into the machine, right? So one day it can be Dr. Seuss, one day it can be lies about Paul Pelosi, another day it can be President Biden and something else. It doesn't matter because nobody at a cable network gets up in the morning at five, scans the headlines and says, oh, I guess there's nothing to talk about today, right? The media ecosystem thrives on speed, hyperbole, and predictability. That, that's what keeps all this going. And there are analogies in the 1850s because Slavery from the Constitutional Convention until the 1830s was explicitly seen as what was known as a necessary evil. Mm -hmm. they, we blamed Britain, right? Britain did this, so we we're just muddling our way through. The framers of the Constitution took steps to ensure two things. One, that there were pro-slavery provisions, but secondly, and vitally, that there could be no property in man. Mm. The Constitution doesn't recognize, how to put it, it acknowledges slavery without affirming it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And so what you have is this uneasiness in the South in the 1780s, 90s, through the age of Jackson. It changes about 1830, 31, 32. Why? partly because of technology, the telegraph, the national distribution of papers, printing presses are more sophisticated. Suddenly, an opinion rendered in Boston can reach Charleston. Mm -hmm. And the folks in Charleston did not want to be told that they were wrong. And the rise of abolitionism in the 1830s became an existential threat. And so what had been seen as a necessary evil, this is, just read the newspapers of the time, becomes what John C. Calhoun called in 1837 a positive good. And that shift from necessary evil mm. to positive good, 
I think meant the war was inevitable. And once you see human enslavement as a positive good, and you tie not only your economic fate, but your cultural identity mm -hmm. to the preservation of that system, and any assault on that system is not simply an assault on the system, but on you, chaos results. Mm -hmm. Very well put. Um, it's funny when we think about the parallels to today, <clears throat> especially like January 6th. I wanted to read this excerpt, if you will allow me. It's my favorite. Read, um, it, read it with a certain uh, respect. I'll read it like this, gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so in the first, so like 1860, there was an issue, will the certification happen properly? Sound familiar? <laughs> you know, Fe February fifteenth. If this, if this doesn't go well, who knows what can happen? So uh, I love what Winifield Scott, who was an aging general of the U.S. Army, said: "Anyone who attempted by force is that good? Is that a good one?" He was actually a Yankee. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anyone who attempt? Oh no, that's not good. <laughs> Anyone who attempted by force or unparliamentary disorder to obstruct or interfere with a lawful count would be lashed to the muzzle of a 12 powder and fired out of a window of the Capitol. I mean, where's this guy now? Yeah, yeah, well, it, 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 he's, it, he's... He was not kidding around. We've gone from Winfield Scott to, and it was Nancy Pelosi. We now, we've seen the film, right? Yeah. When, Mike, when the Constitution is in crisis, I want Nancy in charge. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. She is the toughest woman I've ever known. Yeah. Uh, tough, one of the toughest people. If... Um, I sometimes think, actually, if, if Barbara Pierce Bush had been born a Roman <laughs> Catholic in Baltimore and Nancy D'Alessandro Pelosi had been born a Presbyterian in Rye, they would have been the same person, right? right. If, if, if the speaker has a filter where she doesn't say things she thinks, I don't want to know what doesn't get out. Yeah. Um, and I, I love her and respect her. And we're praying for Paul, who's on the men. Yeah, so, um, absolutely. So... Um, the certification, Lincoln saw this. Mm -hmm. He said uh, he was getting letters about assassination attempts, uh, assassination at the inauguration. Mm. He said, our point of greatest danger, this is the lawyer in him speaking, our point of greatest danger most likely is the electoral count. Because he knew then that if that were blown up, mm -hmm. then you could, you'd have so much chaos that at that point, the governor of Virginia had decided to raise an army of 20,000 people to march into Washington to take over the Capitol and the archives. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this was, wow. I, rem I was reading this, wow. and I, I just had missed it again. This was something that was fascinating. Yeah. I, I just hadn't paid that much attention to it. And here's the thing. We had a vice president of the United States who became a Confederate general and Confederate official, John C. Breckinridge, who had lost to Lincoln, the year before, mm -hmm. in that election. He was being called on like Richard Nixon in 1960 or Al Gore in 2000 mm -hmm. to certify the election that, in which he had lost. He was under immense pressure not to certify the electoral votes. And they were carried in those wooden boxes from the vice president's office on the Senate side over to the House. They had put plainclothes policemen in the crowd from Philadelphia, Baltimore, and New York to restrain anyone who tried to seize them. And Breckinridge stood up on the House floor and followed his oath to that Constitution. And John C. Breckinridge ultimately defended a reprehensible order. Mm -hmm. But in that hour, he followed his oath. He did his duty. And that tells us something. It tells us about our current crisis Two things. One is thrilling. It's that all of us have the capacity, in office or out of office, to do the right thing. And if we do the right thing, we will endure. The terrifying thing is that it's up to us, in office and out of office, to do the right thing. There you have it. Uh, well, let's take some questions. Yes. Who? or I should say, when you first started to research a topic, yeah. where do you go for your primary sources? Hmm. The question. primary sources, it's a great question. Um, the first thing I did for this was I read the collected works. 
of Lincoln. So you want, you want to try to read everything the principal said or wrote. Mm -hmm. um, and then for biography, and then you go, you go to the outer circle. Um, so that, that, that's where it begins. Same with Jefferson. Um, this one was a little more efficient. Jefferson had a public life of 45 years, mm -hmm. uh, 50 years, actually. Um, 55 years, sorry. Math was never a strong suit. Um, and Lincoln was, it was brief, as, as Larry asked, you know, he, he, he only, he was, had, what, three, four terms in the yeah. Illinois House, one term in, Congress, in the U.S. Right? House, mm -hmm. and practiced law, and then he was president. Uh, but it begins with what they said. And there's, a, there's an important volume uh, called The Recollected Words of Abraham Lincoln that some very good scholars, assiduous scholars, put together 30 years ago maybe that went through every primary source you could find to put and then rank the, li the likelihood of whether Lincoln said it or not. Hmm. It's like, remember the Jesus Project, where they, uh, the Scott, group of sort of liberal uh, New Testament scholars mm -hmm. ha would have a vote on what, did Jesus really say this or not? Uh, and they would vote on it, you know, so. Oh, man, how come no one ever asked me to vote on that stuff? I know, <laughs> I know. Your mail-in ballot is on its way. Exactly. Don't Do a provisional. A follow-up to that is, how long does a book like this take from... From, yeah, I want to write that book about Lincoln to Jesus, I can't believe I'm actually done with this thing. I do, yeah, no, there's a lot of, a lot of prayer. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's interesting, and, and I say this as, again, from middle age. Um, I find usually it's four or five years. Okay. Um, I have moved more quickly in recent years for various reasons. Mm -hmm. I did a book called The Soul of America after Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. um, thanks. Uh, uh, and I wanted yeah, it's to hard to put yeah about that killing yeah yeah, Woo, yeah, yeah. oh wait hey, end of democracy Charlottesville yeah. go for it uh, besides that Mrs. Lincoln how was the play yeah um, so uh, and that was designed to be part of the conversation mm -hmm. in real time so that was quick uh, I did a, a short biography of John Lewis mm -hmm. uh I was privileged that he was a friend and mm. was dying and was eager to talk in those last months. Mm -hmm. And so how do you not do that? Yeah. Um, and so this was probably all in four years, mm -hmm. two years full time. My, my dark comic mind just thought that somebody really needs to do Mrs. Lincoln's review of that play. I oh, yeah. Somebody really needs to write yeah. that. You know, since That's you good. asked the question. That's good. <laughs> it's a dark That's question. Uh, all right, who else have we had? Somebody asked me recently, yeah. what, would, what, what would Lincoln say to President Biden? I said, don't go to the theater. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> don't support the arts. <laughs> 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 so nice to see you in the flesh, having seen you so often on cable television. Oh, thank you. Uh, and, and listen to you opine on many subjects. And fast forward from Lincoln, I'm curious to get your take uh, if you have one, on uh, Elon Musk taking over Twitter. <laughs> My, uh, I have a good friend here who asked me that question at dinner. Uh, her version was, when are you getting off Twitter? <laughs> um, I, I'm waiting and seeing, although I didn't have to, we, don't, it looks, we didn't have to wait long, right? Uh, there was the, the lie about Paul. Um, I suspect I'm not long for it. Um, Part of my problem will be, I have a hard enough time turning it on. How the hell I'm going to turn it off? <laughs> I'm going to think of one of my children do it. So I'll probably do it. Actually, I'll have to get home. Um, that sounds kind of funny, but I mean it. Um, uh, I had Instagram for a while, but then it, it just d disappeared. My, actually, mm -hmm. my daughters took it off because they were embarrassed. Um, and I don't know how to get it back. Uh, I, think that it's, I think it's important because... It has an outs, Twitter like cable news, and thank you for your kind words, has an outsize influence on an important part of the conversation, right? So the, the actual number of folks who watch, 
Fox, CNN, and MSNBC is vanishingly small. Mm. I don't know if you, you all know this, but if you take a non, just tonight, so it's a Tuesday night, it's a, bi it's a big news climate, but not a huge news day, I'm guessing. 12 million people? All in? No, but it, it's, even they, I mean, they, 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 they count it. So it's, it's, Fox is the biggest. And Fox is a corrosive force in, in our politics, unquestionably. Um, my point is, and I have this debate with myself a lot, which is, you know, do you, are you doing good by doing it? or are you contributing to a problem? My view is that just because some people use a medium for ill doesn't mean it can't be used for good, and partly because they're using it for ill means that those of us who want to and think we can do it for good are going to, should, should. And so I, I believe in being in that arena. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Twitter is, Interest, interesting. Um, it's the town square. Um, I use it largely as kind of a bulletin board mm -hmm. of what's happening today. You know, um, I get I see a lot of the news stories I see there, um, but I don't think I can. I don't think in the fullness of time I can support something that is so deleterious to the republic. But we'll see. Or you could say it's whack. Mm. It's what? You could say, nah, Twitter's whack. <laughs> is that good or bad? That would be bad. OK. Yeah. 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 I was just giving a shorter answer. I'm yeah, yeah, it's good. <laughs> so yeah, thank you next? for uh, coming out oh, tonight over here. Um, hey. It's been nice. I, you mentioned uh, about Great Britain and their strategy of uh, compensating slave owners. and. It took 170 years, basically, to pay off um, the slave owners and the descendants of, their, of those slave owners. And I'm wondering, it just makes me think about reparation. And yep. uh, you, know, you, you mentioned earlier about looking in the mirror. And I feel like if we're paying off slave owners, right, let's talk about what really needs to happen. Amen. Uh, it, 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 it's a hugely important debate. It's, I've been surprised, actually. I thought that one of the uh, results of, of the first six months of 2020 would be a more serious discussion about it. I've been surprised that it did not get a lot of purchase in the debate, in, in the political debate. Mm -hmm. But Great Britain did pay reparations. It was just to the slave owners. Um, and I do think there's, and Lincoln was on a different side of this than what I'm about to say. Lincoln wanted to move on as quickly as possible, right? That was his view of Reconstruction. It was make the changes they could make. He did get to uh, the franchise for black Americans in the last speech of his life. It was the speech that John Wilkes Booth said, I, that's it, I'm gonna kill him. Booth was at the inauguration, right? And we have a picture of Booth mm -hmm. looming over, you've seen that, right? The 1865 picture, mm -hmm. Booth is there. Yeah. Uh, Washington was a small town. I mean, you had John Wilkes Booth running around, you had Walt Whitman filing reports for the New York Times, <laughs> I mean, it's like, in iambic pentameter. I mean, it was just it was yeah. a tiny, tiny little place. Mm -hmm. um, and people wandered in and out of the White House. Mm -hmm. um, so I, um, I think that the price of moving on so quickly was, and this is retrospective wisdom, the price of moving on was that instead of addressing core problems, we ignored them. We shoved them to the side. 
and that's a historical, I mean, look, by 1876, so what, 11 years after Appomattox, a presidential election is decided as part of a deal mm -hmm. where the last troops would be pulled out of, of the South, of the oh. South mm -hmm. in order to, to secure the presidency for, for Rutherford B. Hayes. And then the Black Codes and Jim Crow and Plessy versus Ferguson. And we still live in, in the long shadow of that. Hi, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. I have a question. Uh, if Lincoln were alive today, would he be called radical, right-wing, extremist? How would you describe him today? Very old, sorry, I have to say that. <laughs> sorry, John, I had to jump in that. Joke. No, it's yeah. good, no, uh, it's, that's whack. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Right. Or is it not? That would be the wrong use. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Wrong use. Trying to be cool. No, yeah. it was a good try. Yeah, no, it was yeah. a good try. Yeah. I was going to wear my T-shirt. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, it was actually a whack attempt. Oh, okay. Yeah. Whack attempt. <laughs> um, no, he would not be seen as radical. Uh, I mean, within... I mean, yeah, of course. If, if you took a 19th century person and put him in the 21st century, <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. He wouldn't know what penicillin was, you know. Uh, what are these flying machines? Yeah, exactly, yeah, mm -hmm. right, you know. Um, but what I think you're asking, perhaps, is, or let me just make this point. Um, see, let me just put this way. See if this sounds familiar. There's an American president who has a violent right wing that has attempted to overthrow elections and is devoted to its own pursuit of power at the expense of union. He's got some folks on the left, on his progressive side, who don't want to cooperate in any way in a system that they believe is fundamentally and irredeemably corrupt. In Lincoln's time, William Lloyd Garrison, the abolitionist we mentioned, burned a copy of the Constitution and said it was an agreement with death and a covenant with hell and that no true abolitionist could participate in American politics because to participate in American politics was to enable an innately racist order. And in the midst of this, you have a well-meaning, human, fallen, frail, and fallible president trying to preserve a Constitution that he believes is essential to working out the promises of the Declaration of Independence. That's who Lincoln would be. So he'd be a cable news host? <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't be a theater critic. Uh, no, he, no, he, you, know, you know what I mean. And our final question for the evening. Um, it's my understanding that Lincoln was not, oh, over here, sorry. This mm -hmm. is a voice, of, this is John Wilkes Booth, who's this? <laughs> <laughs> to the, uh, I Duck. guess you're left. Um, okay. It's my understanding that Lincoln wasn't a when they go low, we go high kind of guy. I'm wondering <laughs> if you have any um, recommendations on strategies or tactics that maybe Lincoln used in uh, his time that are applicable today. He was somebody, from my understanding, who you know, was quite uh, willing to go the extra mile. He suspended habeas corpus. I'm not saying we do anything like that, but I'm wondering, you know, any tactics he used do you think might be useful for today? Yeah, I think he insisted mm -hmm. that, it's a great question. Um, he insisted on asserting a principle that meant possibility for all, not one side prevailing forever, which is what democracy is. He also, which connects to what we were just talking about, he also avoided self-righteousness to a fault. He said, I think in Cincinnati, on his way to become president, pointed across the Ohio River and said, if we were over there, we would probably feel as they feel and act as they act. So he would, there was an, 
there was an innate empathy to Lincoln. And I know that in a tough time, empathy can be seen as weak. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a crucial element whether the, it's, it, you can't reason people into 100% agreement. And I think this, this is something that Lincoln also saw that I believe firmly about today. We're not a 60-40 country. We're barely a 51-49 country. And if we do the right thing 51% of the time, we will build statues to ourselves because we don't do it very much. Mm -hmm. Remember my 1965 point? You know, when people say they want to make America great again, you know, look, I'm a boringly straight, white, southern male Episcopalian. Things work out for me in this country. So if you want to go back to 1955, I'll be fine. You would, <laughs> right? The women would have only voted for 30 years. So, how in good conscience can we argue that reverting to an hour in which we did not see each other as neighbors, but instead saw some people as lesser, how can we say that that's what our country should do? Here's the thing. You don't need 90% of the folks to agree with that. You're not going to get 90% of the people to agree with that. But if just enough of us can do it, then the experiment can go on. If just enough of us can't, it won't. It's a human undertaking. And I'll say this, you know, I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I voted for both parties for president. I will say the margins are closing uh, as time goes on. But I believe in these elections coming up that policy, as important as it is, is not, should not be the dispositive decision factor in your vote. I think a simple sense of fairness and a respect for the rule of law is the most important issue. And then we can go back and argue about marginal tax rates. It drives me crazy when I have Republican friends who say, yeah, Trump's crazy, January 6th bad, but Biden spends too much money. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, 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 no. Until you fix the first two, you don't get the second clause. And if we can reach just if, if just enough of those folks can be reached, then I think there's grounds for hope. But there's nothing guaranteed about this. We're the oldest running constitutional democracy without a monarch. I think the founders would be surprised we made it this far. Right? Once again, they'd be more surprised by the airplanes. The airplanes would be yeah. the airplanes would be that, <laughs> the and the microphones, and, the uh, and again penicillin, cell but, phones. Yeah, you know. but I think that I, you know, I, it's. I didn't think I'd be sitting here in 2022 saying what I just said, saying it doesn't matter if you agree or disagree with a party on fundamental questions of policy. But I believe that. If, you, if, if, if politics is total war and we fall into this Hobbesian war of all against all every time, every minute, where the ambitions and appetites of one side take precedence over everything, then we end up in autocracy. We just do. And I wouldn't have said this even, where are we, November? I wouldn't have said this on November 1st, 2020. Because I didn't think the lie about the election would have the reach and durability that it has. There are 300 election deniers on ballots next week. 
watch Arizona closely. What are we going to do if in 2024 one of these states is won by the Democratic nominee and an election denier, governor, secretary of state, legislature, just say no? Goes to the Supreme Court, I guess. If it ends up in the House of Representatives, there's a unit rule. And if the 2020 election, you know, the pol you know what the plan was, right? The plan was to create so much chaos mm -hmm. with Pence, et cetera, right. that you brought the House of Representatives into it. Mm -hmm. And even though the Democrats had a majority in the House of Representatives, there's a unit rule. So it's if you control the delegation. And the Republicans controlled 25 delegations, 26 delegations. That's how close this was. And Trump would have won. Mike Pence saved the republic in the way John Breckinridge did. And so this is a huge hour of vigilant, empathetic citizenship. I'll stop preaching. No, that's very well said. How about a round of applause for John Meacham, everybody? Thank you, sir. John, thanks so much for being here. You're great. The book, I'll say again, and there was light, Abraham Lincoln and the American Struggle. It's really good. It is for our time. Uh, there's so much just great history in, in here, and it's written uh, so beautifully. John, thanks Thank so you. much. for. Is it whack? It is not whack. It is, it is, the, in, it is the inverse, <laughs> inverse of whack. whack. Yes. Thank you to Larry. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.